Hello there and welcome to another video in my series of deep dive developer tutorials for Dynamics 365 customer engagement. I'm Joe, the CRM chap, and what we want to take a look at today is how we can create a basic plugin for the application and go through the steps from start to finish. We're going to hopefully jump into the coding aspect of the video fairly quickly, setting the scene on some of the topics that we're going to be discussing in a bit more detail. The key thing that we want to try and drive towards is how straightforward it is to work with plugins ultimately. It's not something that you should be scared of necessarily. And we want to try and, as best as possible, replicate a real life scenario so that you can then go away and start to think about how you can use what you've learned within your own business or within your own projects in the future. I'll look at uploading a blog post that will contain the presentation here as well as the complete solution files and a few of the links just for reference purposes. I'm going to assume that you've not had any major experience using some of the tools that we're going to discuss on here in more detail. I'm going to try and approach it from a sort of no knowledge assumed uh, standpoint. However, if you did have some experience using Visual Studio, C Sharp or the application itself, Dynamics 365 or CRM, it's going to be a help as you're moving forward with this. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is set the scene on what Dynamics 365 customer engagement is. Until very recently, you probably would have heard of it referred to as Dynamics CRM, essentially a customer relationship management system developed by Microsoft. The It was very recently rebranded in effect, and the key aim behind that is to emphasize the various modules that sit within the whole of the application suite as a whole. So you know, if you're looking for a specific application to handle your finance systems, if you're looking for an application to be able to do your email campaigns and things like that, you can. there's an application for that essentially within the whole suite. You can take what you need when you need it, more crucially only pay for what you need, and then just bolt on other applications in the future that all integrate together and give you a in effect total business system. So whether you want to manage your sales qualification process, whether you have the ability or have the requirement, let's say, to provide case management functionality to your customers, adding that on within the application as a whole is not going to be a difficult job. And a lot of this stuff will be already pre-built out. And one of the great things as well is that it will also integrate with a lot of the tools that you might be using already as a business, so things like Office 365, Exchange Server, etc., SharePoint, for example. You've also got the option within the application itself to customize it. You don't need to be a developer per se to be able to do this. You can go on, add fields, modify forms, adjust business process flows, all within the application itself without having ever to resort to code. But the nice thing is, as these videos will hopefully demonstrate, is that you can go in and extend the application further with custom code using a lot of the tools, which if you're coming from a Microsoft developer background, you should hopefully be very familiar with. In terms of availability, the application, in most cases, you'll probably want to get it as a cloud, the cloud version of the application via Office 365 subscription. Although, if you are using dynamic CRM or have a requirement to host the application within your on-premise environment, you can also do that as well through volume license or also as well with the current cloud subscriptions, you do get on-premise use rights with the uh, with the licenses that you own, which is really nice because you, you can then go off and have replica environments for development or testing within your own infrastructure potentially. So as I said, a lot of the things that you will tend to do in Dynamics 365 customer engagement will be within the application itself, but in scenarios where you've got some very highly tailored business logic or other requirement which cannot be replicated effectively within the application itself, you can start to look at extending it further. And one of the ways in which we would extend things further is via plugins. So these can be developed either with C Sharp or Visual Basic.net. Generally, what you tend to see is that C Sharp will be the preferred language of choice for this. And a lot of the examples you'll see online will um, will attest to this. You won't, for example, find a lot of VB.net code examples um, when you're doing your own research online. When you're creating them, you would create them as a class file project within Visual Studio. You don't need to have a paid version of the application to do this. You can use the community or free edition to do that. And there's a link on there to, for where you can download that. So there's no real barrier in terms of getting started with them. You don't need to have, basically have a capital investment 
that you need to focus on in order to get going developing plugins for the first time. And then when you start developing your plugin, be, when you and then working with the various assemblies and and other things that are provided as part of the SDK, you're going to have a lot of access in terms of what you can do within the application. So your typical operations when it comes to database operations such as create, read, update, delete, they're going to be available to you. But you've also got exposed to the ability to, for example, trigger a lead qualification, resolve a case, all the actions, a lot of the actions that you would that you can do within the application as you're using it, chances are they're going to be exposed and available to you when you're working with plugins as well. So to get started with your plugin development it does also depend a little bit in terms of what version of the application that you're on. So traditionally what you would you would traditionally have the um, software developer kit for previously Dynamic CRM and now Dynamics 365 which would contain everything in there, your code examples, your your DLLs, your reference, your various uh, tools to help you get started with development, and the download link for that is 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 on the slide there, uh, strictly for versions 8.2 and lower. Moving forward now for version nine of the application. Moving forward, you would use NuGet to access these assemblies and tools, and we'll show you how to do that in the video as well. And NuGet is generally probably the preferred way that you'd be able to do it, but it's just something to watch out for if you are looking search online to try and find, for example, a particular assembly for your version, then chances are moving forward it's going to be on NuGet instead. So so as I say, you've got the language the language of choice when it comes to writing plugins will, will generally be C-sharp. So it's useful just to set the scene a little bit in terms of what that is. It's an object-oriented programming language, which has been primarily spearheaded by Microsoft for the past uh, 10 to 15 years as part of the .NET framework of programming languages. It's derived, as you can probably guess, from C, so it has a lot of similarities to the language of C and also to others such as Java, PHP. So one of the benefits of that is that if you have got a background in other programming languages, the journey to learning how to get going with C Sharp is not going to be too onerous. You should find your feet fairly quickly. And one of the really nice things about it is that it it's very versatile when it comes to what, what it is you're trying to achieve. So if you've just got a requirement to have a simple console-based application that goes off and performs some tasks for you, it can do that. You can then take things as far as you want with it. You could develop a whole application, web or desktop application through it. You could even look at, for example, integrating with things like the like Unity engine to develop games and things like that. You've got a lot that you can do with the language. So having been able to say from a you know, personal development or from a CV point of view that you've got C sharp on, on there is going to really help you out when it comes to you know when it comes to potential future roles and things like that. So I'd say if, if you've got a background with other languages, the journey with C sharp should be fairly straightforward, I would hope. However, if you are coming into coding for the first time, then the good news is there is a lot of tutorials online which to help get you going. Microsoft in particular have also focusing a lot more in recent years on providing really good tutorials and really good getting started guides. So I've linked to one in there on the slide there. So I would encourage you to check that out and you know get started learning your first writing your first C sharp application. Okay so we've 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 set we've set the background then so it's time to go into the details of the scenario that we're going to be working through as part of the demo. So we're working as part with a business at the moment. They're using the application to manage their contacts, contact records for the various people that they're working with and using other aspects of the sales management functionality of the application as a consequence. Um, one of the issues that they're finding is that when name files are entered, there's, there's no consistency that's been enforced in terms of how these files are being entered. So in most cases, you'd want to have it as Jane Smith with a capital J S as we've written there on the slide. However, people just tend to use the system and do all sorts on there. Now this wouldn't be a problem in most cases, but because we're using the name value on there to be able to populate our electronic and direct mail campaigns, there's some effort that we need to go to to ensure that the name data is cleansed manually so that we're presenting a professional appearance when doing um, external communications. 
At the moment that's having to be a manual job that's being done so we want to look at automating that process and cleansing these addresses manually so that they're written in a sort of presentable formatable way. So the solution that we're going to look at to develop that is going to be a plugin. It's going to be what's called a pre-validation plugin focused on the contact entity and what that will do is that we will essentially format the names in the correct formatting before saving them down into the database. What we also want to do as well is ensure that the plugin executes whenever a new contact record is created or an existing one is updated as well. So as we'll get into it, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about some of these terms, pre-validation, entities, etc. And hopefully you'll get a good understanding of what those terms are and what they mean. Okay, so let's jump into the demo and create our first plugin. Okay, we're back now within the uh, Dynamics 365 application itself. And what we've got at the moment is that we've just opened a default contact record. Um, from within the application, we've gone to the uh, sales area, gone to contacts, and just selected this example record on there for Alex Simmons. Um, as you can see, this has been entered quite sort of nicely, as we sort of hope it to be. Um, but let's just say I want to go in there, and I just want to change this to maybe something a bit different, something which we wouldn't want to be in there from a name formatting point of view. Uh, as you can see, there's nothing in the system at the moment that's going to change that for us um, so our next step is that you know we need to start building out this plugin uh, which basically handles all of that behind the scenes um, without the user even sort of realizing so if I were to go into the application and make that change um, the system just going to go oh, okay I know what you've done here I'm going to fix that name for you and then it's going to come back and the user's going to be like oh okay it, it's how it should be okay so what we need to do first of all, before we go into there, I mentioned earlier about how the, the version information is going to be quite important for the assemblies. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly just double check on here what version of the application we're working with because that's going to have some um, bearing uh, in a few minutes when we get into into NuGet package. As you can see on here, we're on version 9 of the application onto here. This is the bit here that you're most concerned with. You, this bit here is for the database version, which may be different. Um, you wouldn't really pay attention to that, but this is we need to just make sure that our SDK assemblies are for version 9 and above. On this machine, I've installed um, Visual Studio 2015 and also 2017 as well. Um, I'm, for this demo, I'm using the professional version of the application, but if you download the Community Edition, um, it'll be pretty much the same, except it will say Community Edition on there. Um, in terms of version of Visual Studio, you can use either 2017 or 2015. Any version should work in theory. Um, the 2017 one um, is a bit nicer in terms of um, the look and the feel of it, which is why I'm sort of using that one on here. With Visual Studio open, then we can then look at going to create our class file project. So we go up to New and to Project. At this point, we'll see our um, basically template window on here. So when you first install Visual Studio, by default, you're going to have all of the um, Visual C Sharp, Visual Basic um, uh, templates onto there. So when you when you go through the setup and installation of Visual Studio, as long as you don't specifically remove it from the window when you're installing it, you're going to have these templates um, by default. If not, then just check, um, do a reinstall and just double check to make sure what templates you've got installed. So we're going to develop in C-sharp as we've discussed and then we're going to want to select the class library .NET Framework um, project type and we're going to give this just a very um, somewhat descriptive name, we're going to call it d365.sample okay. and we're going to create a directory for this solution, um, it's going to be saved in my documents folder so if I just click OK on that now, it's going to go out and create um, our solution and project that we can then use to start developing with. Okay, so it's it's developed that out. So we've got just a, a project with just a basic class file onto that, in um, which we can then start to develop or even add additional class files onto. Before we start looking at doing anything coding, um, when you're deploying out a plugin into the um, application, you need to make sure that the assembly has been essentially signed um, before it's deployed out, so that the application knows that it's come from a verifiable source. If you try and upload a um, a sort of um, assembly which hasn't been signed then you're likely going to get an error, for, error so it's always good as a first step when you're creating your project just to basically get that done first so we're going to go to properties we'll go down to signing down here and then we're going to tick the box here to say sign the assembly 
there's not going to be a strong name key file specified yet. Um, you generally create a new one, or if you have created one previously, you can select that. For this, so we're just going to go new on to that, um, and I'm just going to call this uh, D365 sample plugin uh, strong name key. Um, you would generally put a password in, uh, it's optional. Um, for this one, I'm just going to put any old password in, doesn't really matter. Um, but that is an optional step, just to, um, as an FYI on there. And then as soon as that's been created, we can see it's been added into our project automatically. Um, there's nothing more we need to do. That's all done now, so we can happily, um, happily look at starting to code. So we're going to save that up there and then close that window and back to our class file. The next step before we can start developing the plugin code is we need to basically get our assemblies. Um, now, because we're working with version 9 of the application, as we saw, we're going to need to look at going on to NuGet to get our assemblies. Um, so on here you've got references on um, to some of the default uh, assemblies that you have available to C Sharp. We're going to want to right click on there and go to manage NuGet packages. And then from here we're going to be able to go on to browse and go on to essentially the, the uh, I don't know how you would describe it, sort of store or, you know, um, you know, directory of different um, custom assemblies you've got out there. So, you know, anything from, you know, bootstrap through to, you know, more specific things you can potentially find on NuGet. We're going to type in the, the Microsoft uh, CRM SDK core assemblies. That should be enough. And there's going to be this download here that we want on there. So this is going to give us both the Microsoft XRM SDK.dll and also the slightly older CRM.sdk.proxy.dll, which is what we need to start developing our plugin. So we're going to make sure it's going on the same version as us. Um, I'm going to choose, just to be on the safe side, the 9.0.0.5 one on there, because uh, that's the closest version that we've got um, onto here. Uh, it should work either way, but um, just to be on the safe side. Um, you have to basically just confirm, yep, yeah, okay, I want to install this, yep, yeah, I accept the license, and then it just goes off, it retrieves the package, and then it um, um, downloads it and adds it automatically to your project. So as you can see on there, we've got those two new references onto there. Okay, and with that, we can then look at starting to code. So we close that down. We're going to rename our class file, give it a nice descriptive name so we know um, know what it is. So I'm going to call this pre contact create underscore format name values. Now the naming convention is really just something that you know you can you can make a decision on. Uh, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, this is just my preference in terms of it gives you a descriptive, um, a, you know, a, at a glance view in terms of okay. What, what this plugin is and what it's doing type thing. So, but really, you can use any naming convention. I guess the key thing is just be consistent with what you're doing. Don't be doing a hodgepodge of different stuff because that's going to probably cause some confusion down the line. Um, when we rename a class file, we'll basically Visual Studio basically asks us if we want to rename all the references to the code in the project. We want to make sure we click yes on that. And as we can see on here, the public class has been updated to reflect the name on that. So always make sure you do that when renaming the class files because otherwise things could start to break. Okay, so now we're in our class file now. Um, so at the top here, we've got our using statements, which basically are references to some of the different classes within our um, assemblies onto here. Um, it adds in some of the ones that you're probably going to need in most cases. For this particular scenario, we're only really going to need the, the system one on there. So we can look at getting rid of those two there. Um, and we're also going to need to look at adding in two additional ones. So we're going to need to add in a using statement to the system.globalization um, class. Um, we use that further down the line to perform some of the, um, the formatting, which I'll go into a bit more detail on. And then the core assembly that we need, which has got everything we need for this particular plugin, is the Microsoft.xrm.sdk. Um, uh, using statements, so we plonk that in. We always make sure that we put semicolons at the end of it, because otherwise, um, one of the things with C Sharp is that it will um, it will break otherwise. It's one of the things. As we'll go through, you'll see we add in probably semicolons to probably almost everything. So we are using statements onto there. We can now go on and basically at our at the top where it says our um, uh, public class, we can go colon slash i plugin. We'll know if we've done it correctly because it will go blue like that. It'll also we'll also have a red squiggly line up here. So once you've typed it and it's gone blue, if you press Control and full stop, you've then got an option to implement the interface, which is what we're going to want to do. 
So what this is basically doing is that um, for the for a plugin to work, you need to have code within the execute method um, to execute. And so basically any code that's within there will be executed when the plugin is triggered. So it's basically a minimum requirement for every plugin. Um, in terms of the not implemented exception, we don't need this for this example. We're not going to worry too much as part of this in terms of doing error handling and things like that. So we're just going to remove that line. And then from there, we can then look at starting to build out our, um, our plugin code. So the first thing we're going to want to do is that when the plugin execute, executes for the first time, we'll get, there's a lot of information about the um, execution session, which you want to be able to get a hold of. Um, that's exposed by the iPlugin uh, execution context. So we're going to add this line onto here where we basically grab the, um, grab the context information about the um, the plugin and we get this from the service provider which is exposed to the um, to the plugin at the time of execution. So when we get service it's going to be a type of i plugin execution context and oh we've got a slight typo on there so let's fix that. Okay that looks all fine. So with the context now, we've got access to quite a lot of different properties. So if we just do write as a test context online on there, we can see we've got all this information onto here. We've got the, the business unit that the code was executed in, any input parameters, the username that's done it. There's a whole lot of different stuff that we can expose on there. And we'll start to extract some of that information in a few minutes. Um, now, the next step here is, is optional, but generally because of because we're going to be looking at deploying onto a, a online version of Dynamics 365 Customer Engagement, um, our options when it comes to debugging sam um, sam debugging plugins is um, limited. So we're going to want to look at implementing tracing on the plugin. So we can, and what that does is when we um, set a particular setting within the, within the application, we can output messages into the um, into the application to be each time a plugin is run. So we can see at which points it's hitting particular code blocks or at which point it could be failing that. So to do that, we basically need to get a reference to the eye tracing service, which we encapsulate into there. Uh, so we give it a name, tracing service, and then we, will, we then just grab that um, again from the service provider. The service provider is really going to be our... Um, the key to it is the key to everything when it comes to a plugin when you're trying to get stuff and I can't seem to type for some reason. Uh, let's try now. So yeah, so I'm gonna get the service provider, we're gonna get the service, and it's gonna be a type of uh, type of eye tracing service. Okay, so semicolon into that, that should all be fine. So with that now we can then specifically um, Activate the tracing service by just writing a, an initial message out to the um, out to the trace. So in this case, we're just going to write out a quick line just to say the tracing has been implemented successfully. And then any time we want to write something out to the trace log, we will just call this particular code block here. And then what what then follows within the the brackets there will then get written out into the, into the trace log. Okay, so we've done all the necessary setup, so we can now start to grab the information about the entity that we're working with, in this case the contact record. Um, so what we'd look at doing is we just want to do a quick check just to make sure that the when the plugin is executed, we have actually have got a, um, a contact record there that we can play around with, and we can do that via an if statement on here. So we basically just do a quick check to see, okay, does have we got an entity to play around with? Um, and is it basically an entity, i.e. a record, that we can start to interrogate? And we just do that via um, two lines onto there. Um, and then the if block, you then have the curly braces run on there. So we then any further code that we then write needs to be put underneath this onto here. So assuming it passes that check there, yep, we've got our um, contact record and it is an entity, it is a record. We can then actually get, get our contact record in order to properties, fields, you know, and all the detail onto that, and we get that into an entity object. So we do entity contact to basically get a entity object, and then we again derive that from our context. In this case, it will be our input parameters, and it will be the target, um, which is why we do the check up at the top there, just to make sure that we have actually got that there, because we don't want to, if we start to attempt to access things which aren't there, then we're going to start getting problems and errors, which uh, nobody likes. 
Uh, and I've just noticed that I've not put square braces onto there, so let's just fix that for a second. And yep, that seems to be fine. Okay, so we've got our entity, we've got our contact record, and all its details. So with that, we can then start to get our properties. So the fields that we saw in the application will be our first name and our last name fields. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that the display names and the actual um, the field names that you need to use when accessing them will potentially be different. Um, so the best way in terms of determining what the values are is on the form. If you go to the form editor by clicking on form at the top, um, you can double click onto the, the fields which you wanted to access and basically interrogate them to find out what their logical names are. So in this case, um, in this case they're not actually on the form, uh, which doesn't help, but I'll show you for the full name field. So what we've got on this form at the moment is we've got a composite field with the first and last name. Um, so it will take whatever values are in there and then create a field value based on that. But um, essentially if they were on the form, so for the first name field for example, we go on there and the value that we want to that we use to access the field naming code will be this one here, the name. It will generally be a lowercase um, lowercase name or one word with no spaces on. So for this particular example, we're going to be wanting to get the, um, it will be first name and last name that we want to do and they'll all be lowercase. So if we do the first name first, we're going to use a method that's exposed to us on here, which is the get attribute value. Uh, so basically we just want to, it does what it says in the tin, we want to get this attribute which is of a string data type and then we want to, um, here's the name of it, so in this case first name. It's worth mentioning that this is probably the best, better way of being able to grab the, um, um, you know, an attribute value name. Um, the other way, if I just finish typing this to do it, um, does have some problems. So for example, if you don't want to use get attribute value, you could use contact um, um, square bracket and then give the name of the attribute, so in this case first name, and that would get you the um, that would give you the value and then you obviously do something like string test and course or something like that. The problem is though if, the, if there is no value in that field um, when you, oh no we missed that line there, we need to do, uh, do the string. Okay that might not be right but yeah but essentially if you were to do it this way um, if it cannot access any value within that field you'll get an instant error back to the application the benefit with this is if there is no field value available when it attempts to grab that, it will return a null value. So you can further along the code, you can do null tests, and we'll see how that we'll see in this particular example how that works as well um, in terms of doing null tests and stuff like that. So it's it's generally I prefer it because of, you know you can then do checks against the values and stuff like that, and it also more importantly doesn't break your code, which is always nice. So we've got our first name and last name values. Um, we're now going to be wanting to. In order to basically um, sort out the name values, we need to use a built-in function within the within C Sharp to um, format the names, um, and we do that using um, a, two, a two title case method within the within the text info on the globalizations um, assembly. Um, so what we have to do first of all, part of that is basically specify what um, what language we're working with. So essentially culture information. So this will be different depending on where you're from in the world. Um, I'm from the UK, as you may have been able to tell, so in which case it will be EN-GB. If you're in the US, it will be EN-US. Um, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the blog post in terms of where you can get the information from um, you know, for your particular scenario, but they're basically the ISO codes for languages and countries. So we specify our culture um, and then we specify um, false for the use over if, um, for the use user override that should be. Okay, and with that specified, um, we'll just make sure that, that uh, ah, we need to add an extra bit onto there. We want to get the text info property. Okay, that's all good. Okay, so with that specified now we can then get into actually um, fixing the name values itself. So, so we'll do the first name first uh -huh. um, and 
and we'll just do a quick check. We want to make sure we've got a value in that field first. It could, it could be that um, you don't always have a value in those fields. As we can see within the application, um, only the last name field is mandatory, so it could be that we just have Simmons in there. So we just want to make sure we do a quick test to make sure we've got data in there before we try and start updating things. We're going to just write out quickly to the trace log the value of the um, of the first name field before we make the change. This is to help us with diagnosing in, in the future if we need to, if we're trying to figure out something that's gone wrong. And then we get into the bit of actually doing the update operation. So in this particular case, what we would do is similar to what I showed you a, a while ago, you just, you'd just access the property of the um, first name field and then you can just set its value this way. So in this case, we're just gonna do culture, uh, two title case, and then what we do is we get the first name value, but then we specifically cast that into lowercase value before we start to mess around with it. Because otherwise, if we've got a um, if we've got a name value that's in all uppercase, um, it's not going to be able to do it, put it into title case because it's already in uppercase. So we just put it to lower and then we set it to proper title case as it should be. Okay, and then once that's done, um, we then do a, um, an additional output into the trace log. Um, we do first name after value equals uh, contact dot get attribute uh, value string uh, basically the same code as before just to get what the new value is and because we're accessing the entity object after we've made the change on there we should be able to get the brand new updated value from there which is uh, which is handy okay. And before we then move on to the last name field, we just want to put a, um, so with, with if statement you can have an else, so if it doesn't meet the conditions you then have a default action which is basically executed instead. Um, so I'm just going to basically output to the trace log to say okay well if we if, if, the, if there's no value in there then we're going to say okay we've not done anything with the um, with that file field value. Just again for debugging purposes, this is all, this is all really sort of optional stuff. It's you can you know, judge for yourself whether or not you think it would be useful for your particular scenario. Okay, Okay. so with that done then, um, we can then do the last name. Because we've got most of the code written out already, I can just do a quick uh, copy via control C, uh, and then go down into here, and then we just need to just tinker around with these values onto here. So instead of the first name, I want to do last name instead. Uh, we just need to make sure we change all of these. And there is potentially a faster way of doing this, but I just want to make sure I'm doing it manually so I don't miss anything. Uh, so I do last name onto there. Oh, we need to change that as well. Last name. Last name. Uh, I think just after this one more, but I'll do a check. So last name. Okay, so we've got last name before value, last name, last name, last name, last name, last name, last name, perfect. Okay, so that's both of that done for the first and last name. So the only other bit is just to quickly just do a quick final message to the trace log where we just say that the plugin execution has been completed. So just give the name of the plugin and just do a quick message to say plugin execution completed. And that's it, we've basically now written our first plugin from scratch. And it's only taken, I think, about what, five, ten minutes? So not too bad going. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick check through here just to make sure there's no errors or anything. Uh, that's always the, uh, the devil's always in the details when it comes to these things. Um, we seem to be getting a red mark there for some reason. Usually a good way of being able to tell if you've maybe written something that's not allowed or not, you can just do a quick build of the project. Ah, yeah, I thought we had something missing, so where is it? Semicolon. See, this is why you always make sure you put semicolons on. Ah, right at the bottom, okay. So I save that now, that's all gone to green, so that should now build successfully if I right click on there. Okay, and looks like that's all good to go, although the proof will be in the pudding. Um, so with that done then, um, if we now right click on our project and go to open folder in File Explorer, we then go into the bin and the debug folder, we'll see we've got a DLL there. 
and that is what we then need to upload into uh, the application. Okay. So the next bit, you'll need to have the plugin registration tool, which you'll get either from the SDK or you can also download via the the NuGet as well. So I've already got a an instance of the um, of the uh, plugin registration tool open. Um, what you'll generally do is you create a brand new uh, connection. You populate your username and password into there, and then you just log in. If you've got multiple um, instances on your tenant you would want to specify that first um, otherwise what it will do it will attempt to log into the default um, organization which you may not want it to do but potentially you know if you have a scenario where you deploy out into dev and then staging and then production you don't want to accidentally deploy stuff out into production without um, realizing so it's going to go and check on the organ on the um, in the region for where the CRM tenant is, in which case North America, and it's going to log into the organisation. Usually shouldn't take too long. Yep, there we go. So all booting up. Okay, and then. We can see there's, there's some plugins in here already, some which have been um, deployed by Microsoft, some other ones that have been done for testing purposes. Um, we'll just ignore this though. The bit that most interests us is that we want to be able to register, excuse me, uh, register a brand new assembly. So we registered, click on that at the top there. Um, we specify the location where the assembly is. Um, so because we've got it open onto here, we can just do Control C just to grab that location, and then we're going to want to select that onto there. As we can see, it's picked up our plugin class file into there and tipped that automatically. So we don't need to do anything onto there. The isolation mode, if you deploy now into the into an online instance, it will have to be sandbox. Um, all plugins have to be deployed to sandbox if they're online. Um, there is an option to specify not specify into the sandbox um, if you've got an on-premise version of the application, but generally you want to make sure that you do it to the sandbox. And step four, you always want to leave it as database because, well, for online instances anyway, you won't have access to the disk or the GAC. Um, if you are on premise, you can look at doing that, but in most cases, just the database will be fine. There shouldn't really need to be a requirement to do any of those. So if we click on that, register selected plugins, uh, we get a uh, message back to say one assembly registered and one plugin registered. And then the window then refreshes, then when we expand this open onto here, we can see our plugin is in there. There is one, well, two additional steps that we need to do, however, before the plugin will start executing. We have to set up what are called steps within the application. And steps are basically instructions telling the application, okay, when do I execute this plugin? Okay. So we'll set up our first step now. So as we just as we mentioned um, before we kicked off the demo, we want the plugin to execute whenever a contact record is created or updated. So we're going to want to trigger the um, the plugin to execute on the the messages for them in the application. So in which case the create and update messages. So we right click on our plugin. We go to register new step. Um, we type in create for our message. Our primary entity will be the contact in lowercase. Uh, we can ignore everything else on here. Now, the event pipeline stage of execution, we mentioned earlier uh, the fact it needed to be a uh, pre-validation plugin. So you've got various stages of the execution of when, a, of when the message is played back in the system where you can basically trigger your plugin. So pre-validation will be before the, the record is essentially submitted to the database to... Um, to be written into, so where checks are done on the record. The pre-operation will be before the database transaction, and then the post-operation will be after the database transaction. Now, because we're wanting to base to ensure that the name field updates correctly um, for the user in the application, um, we need to make sure that's done in the pre-validation phase. Um, it's always worth having to think about when you want your pipeline um, when you want your plugin to be executed, um, because you know essentially, if you, for example, need to modify a field before it's saved into the database, then a pre or pre um, pipeline stage plugin is going to be your best shout. If, however, you're happy, you need to basically get values once they've been created in the database, then a post operation plugin is going to be your best shout for that. Okay, so, so we've done it. So pre validation, create on the contact record, so we can register that new step in the application. 
And then finally, um, within the plugin registration tool, we just need to do an additional step for the update message so we can make sure it, whenever the first and last name values are changed, we can make sure the plugin triggers on that as well. Now, because we're doing that on the update operation, we have the option to specify filtering attributes. Um, so I'd always highly recommend that you use this. You only want to be executing the plugin when um, for the fields that are affected by it, because um, otherwise you've every time a record changes you're going to have plugins firing when they don't need to um, which is going to use up system resources and potentially cause problems when people are saving records so in this case we just want to select the first and last name field um, as the as the as the fields that will basically trigger the um, um, the plugin to execute and we click ok on that we can see it's been updated and then we just do pre-validation again on that uh, we do a final check, update contact for pre-validation on the first name and last name, and then we register that step in the tool. So, with them both created, um, that's now working. So when we go into the application now, and this is the um, always the most forward part of any demo, this is when we can actually make a change in the system and see it reflected. So, let's just change this something. Let's just call, change this to, uh, I don't know, we'll go, we'll go with our, maybe our Jane Smith's example that we did earlier. Actually, one thing you should do, so whenever you make any plugin changes, you should probably just make sure you just do a quick refresh of the application. Just to be sure, I mean, plugins, it's usually okay. Usually it will pick you up after, um, straight away when you do it in, but it's, if you're doing, most generally anyway, any change that you do make, you probably do want to make sure you're doing just a quick refresh just to make sure that it's picked up the, um, any updated changes in the application. So just give that a moment just to refresh and then we should be straight back into our um, Alex Simmons record. Okay, well, we really needed to change Simmons, didn't we? So that's fine. So just give it a second just to load up. Okay. Okay, so let's just say we're going to change this now. We'll, we'll change it back to, um, we'll change it to Alex Jones, shall we? So Alex um, Jones, and we'll do Jones in lowercase, just to basically uh, demonstrate it working on both fields. If we click Save on that now, it'll go off and um, make the changes. And as we can see, it's basically updated our first name and last name fields to format them in the correct way that we need them to be. Okay, and that's how we do the plugin from start to finish. All right, well, I hope the demo has been useful and you, you feel as if you're in a good place now to get going with plugin development for the first time. So the only thing I just want to leave you with now is just a few tips and things to bear in mind that I hope will help in your journey. So as with a lot of the developer extensions related to the application and the various topics that we're going to discuss as part of this video series, you should always see them as a last resort. So the great thing about Dynamics 365 customer engagement is there are a lot of tools provided out of the box to help you achieve, you know, potentially quite simple to more complex business requirements. So you've got things like business rules or workflows and you can do things with them such as, you know, send an email to a particular record update a record based on a set of conditions you know so they sh those should be used as much as possible where you can you shouldn't be going to plugins you know to achieve what you can essentially you know with, with a workflow I guess where plugins then come into the mix is when you've then got potentially quite complex business requirements or you're in a scenario where you cannot sort of neatly achieve the same functionality using another tool that the application provides you so what I mean by that is, is so for example, you know, you've got let's say a workflow that's got, you know, potentially two pages of different conditions and actions. It's got maybe several child workflows, whereas you know you could potentially replicate that as a two-line plugin. You know, so those would be the sort of situations where I'd encourage you to look at a plugin. But in most cases, use the tools what you've got within the application and don't ignore them when you're scoping things out from a business requirements point of view. It's important to remember, particularly if you're working with the online version of the application, the limitations around sandbox and plugins deployed into there. So all plugins deployed to Dynamics 365 customer engagement online will need to be deployed into the sandbox. And there is a 
timeout execution limit of two minutes for all plugins on there. So if your plugin takes longer than two minutes to fully complete all steps, then the application will automatically kill that. So be sure to do thorough testing of your plugins and ensure that they don't reach that threshold because you could find yourself in a situation where your required business logic isn't being executed when you need it to. When you're doing a lot of plugin development, it is also useful to start thinking about, okay, well, how could you know, can I set up a template file that I can reuse? So a lot of the things that we did in terms of preparing the initial plugin class file, you know, getting the reference to the organization service, um, setting up our tracing, you know, all of those are common actions that you would tend to do each time you create a plugin. So try and think about how you can essentially create a template for that and really sort of strive towards, you know, reusing your code as much as possible because it's going to help you save a lot of time in the, in the long run. It's also important as well as, as with a lot of things when it comes to developer um, developer focused things is that you give very clear sort of naming conventions. So what I would tend to recommend is that you try and indicate what the in the name of the plugin class what type of plugin it is, the name of the entity it's targeting, and also give some indication of what stage the pipeline it executes on. That way, it's clear to others who are looking at the class file what the various bits are doing. And you've also got an easy way of being able to tell at a glance, okay, well, I know when I'm then deploying that plugin out into the application, I know what I need to do from a configuration point of view to deploy it successfully. And then the final thing that you want to maybe want to start thinking about if you're working as part of a team or you've got other um, developer pieces that you're doing around the applications so of things like JScript or or you know custom workflow assemblies is start to store them in a git repository use something like you know team foundation server uh, github bitbucket etc to manage your code within there enable things such as rollback and also enable others to work on the code at the same time as you and manage any conflicts that arise apart of that so all it leads me to say at this stage is thank you very much for watching the video if you have any questions relating to the content of the video then be sure to leave them in the comments below. You can also follow me on Twitter and I would welcome any suggestions that you might have on there regarding potential future video content and then finally you can also subscribe to the channel and get a notification through when new videos are uploaded so thanks again and goodbye.